Hello and welcome to the History with Jackson podcast. This episode of History of Jackson was sponsored by the Bean Around Coffee. The Bean Around Coffee is based in Peterborough and they sell and make some amazing coffee. You can head to their website to buy some coffee beans or some coffee grounds. Now they make some fantastic coffee and it is my favourite coffee in the country. And for you want to grab yourself some coffee, head to www.thebeanaround.com and use the discount code HWJ and the bear 10 for 10% off all your purchases. I'll leave the discount code and the website in the description below. Hello guys, welcome to History of Jackson, the podcast where we bring up-to-date historical research to you guys in an accessible way, presented by Past and Present Media. So today guys, we have Eilis S. Carter on the podcast to talk about her brand new book, Red Menace, How Lipstick Changed the Face of American History. And I'm really excited to talk about this book. I found it really fascinating, interesting. And I know you guys are going to love listening to Eilis talk about her brand new book today. So Eilis, thank you for coming on the podcast. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me here. Excited to, to talk about it with you. No, I'm really excited as well. And, you know, I reading your book, I found it so, so interesting. And I learned so much history that I've I didn't know before, but I really wanted to start with a question. You know, what inspired you to write this book? It, you know, it's funny. It's a couple of things, but the the if I'm being honest, it really almost started on a whim. Um, there used to be, there still is rather, a publisher, and I for, always forget their name, and they did single subject books. And so they've done books on like the history of the hoodie, the history of um, the remote control, very singularly focused books. And I was wondering if anyone had done one on lipstick. And that's probably because uh, I was working as a, I still work as a beauty copywriter. I work in the industry. I've worked as a journalist and I also am a performer. And when I perform, um, I dress in a way that what my friend calls being a female female impersonator. Like, you know, it's practically drag, but I am assigned female at birth. Uh, so it, it has this whole other layer to it. Uh, so I guess I just had lipstick on the on my brain. Uh, so it, it kind of just started out as a whim. And then once I started researching it, I was like, oh, this is a whole micro history. There's a there's a lot here um, and there really wasn't anything else out there like it. I thought there would be tons, but there are a lot of coffee table books about the history of beauty. There's some stuff about how much people love red lipstick, but there was really nothing there that was like a history where they people really went into the library and uh, did the you know, the history and what it meant. And I, um, I think you very nicely described it earlier as a social history. And I, that was really very much there. So um, the more I dug in, the more I'm like, this is a story I hasn't been told and I really want to tell. It's, it's really interesting that you were able to, you know, pull elements from your life as a performer and, and, and go out on that whim that you had to, to write yeah. a book that, that you wanted to read it now, wasn't an, yeah, it wasn't an easy sell I mean people are like <laughs> well it's it's for girls and it's it's a niche and I guess it is but it's also like well makeup is a multi-billion dollar industry and you know it, it never occurs to me actually you're the <laughs> Don't add, don't, I, uh, you, if you were going to say it now, you can't because every male interview I've ever had said, well, I've never worn lipstick. And I am always like, I don't care. And, you know, that's, if you do, you don't, that's your, that's awesome. That's your business. But like, you never, I was talking to someone about it. I was like, well, you never stop someone who wrote about the civil war. And it's like, well, I didn't fight in the civil war. Is this book still for me? And, or whatever you know name your historical you know I I wasn't at Waterloo and I've still read about it so it was uh a, a kind of getting people interested in it wasn't easy yeah I can I can 
I can certainly imagine that. And I think the book that you've written, you know, people should be interested in it because it is, you know, really fascinating history that delves into loads of different facets of American life. And and like you said, it doesn't matter if you you wear lipstick or if you don't wear lipstick or you're involved in the Civil War or not involved in the Civil War. You can still learn about it and be interested in it. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> People ask me for advice. I'm like, what? I am the last person you should ask. <laughs> it's like, what color you should wear? A, I don't get a kickback, and B, <laughs> you know, that's the whatever you like is fine by me. It's a it's a difficult field sometimes selling history books and then trying to sell history to people. Yeah. But one of the one of the things I wanted to look at as well, and, and we've mentioned this before we've we've started recording the podcast, you know, what form did early lipstick take? And I know you you want to bust a myth uh yeah. with the beginnings of lipstick. Well, in America, we th- if I, I have gone into you know lecture in a room and I said, who do you think is the first first lady? Because often we that's a good uh, marker of history for Americans is they'll like, guess, you know, you know, the first lady and they're very associated with what era, whatever era they're in. And I say, who do you think is the first, first lady to wear lipstick? And people will generally say like Eleanor Roosevelt, which puts it at the beginning of the thirties. And the answer is actually Martha Washington, who's our first, first lady, uh, wife of, of George Washington. And she, um, she had her own recipe for lip color, which was more like a, it's like a lip balm, but it was a colored, it, it had a red tint to it. And it was, it contained earwax from whales, uh, which obviously you thankfully cannot get anymore. It contained lard. It contained various roots in it to give it color. And it contained raisins and a little sugar. So it just, somebody made a version, I think they substitute, substituted beeswax, which you can get for uh, ear, whale earwax, spermacetti is what that's called. Um, and the, somebody on the internet, obviously, of course, made it. Uh, and it's very greasy <laughs> and it's pretty gross. Uh, and uh, in an era of cruelty free, I highly don't recommend it. Uh, but it, it's much earlier than people think. And I, we also have this image of it being very low class and very associated with sex workers. And I found that often almost the opposite was true. It was a function of, um, upper class women were wearing it because they had the disposable income and they weren't, doing domestic labor or working on farms or anything, you know, it's a, it's a highly impractical item. It's, it's, if you're, you know, plowing fields or li- or raising, lifting kids or doing laundry by hand on the plains of America, it's really not the first thing that comes to mind. Um, and it was either imported or you had to make it and it was expensive, which meant it was expensive. Um, so I, I think some of our ideas about it came in later and were sort of backfilled rather than being what actually happened. So it's an interesting history because what was actually happening is not the same thing as what people think was happening. I think, I think it's very formed by pop culture, the way we Americans view the Wild West as being very John Wayne, and it really was not like that at all. Uh, so I think our our perception of it is very fueled by later movies and TV shows and and uh, women's magazines that sort of, you know, like I said, backfill story that wasn't actually there. And we came to accept that as the truth. It's yeah, I I, I certainly wouldn't want to put Martha Washington's uh, yeah. recipe <laughs> yeah. on my lips. It didn't sound particularly appealing uh, when you were detailing the ingredients. <laughs> I remember when I found it, describing to my best friend who's a vegetarian, and she's like, "That's disgusting," and I'm like, "I know you hate raisins." <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it's also 
it's also interesting how you know we we look at you know how movies are shaping our hor- uh, his- horrible historical uh, perception of certain periods uh, and and the role of certain items in this case lipstick and and their place in society um, and it's happened with so many different topics and it's really interesting that lipstick is one of those now if historical films and uh, media is shaping the way we see um, lipstick today from the past you know, what was the what was the reaction of the press uh, and maybe women's magazines and the women's press to the emergence of women's beauty products then uh you know it's interesting women there's some very interesting they're varied and, and some very interesting ones and i think there was a tendency and i think there's still a tendency not that we're completely over this is to dismiss anything that is sort of of interest to women as silly. I was really surprised because it was even before World War I, uh, some senator was going off on, you know, the uh, government, you know, government offices and statistics puts out how much money we spent on toiletries and cosmetics and, you know, Americans had spent some astronomical sum at the turn of the last century uh on cosmetics on on rouge and lipstick and and powder and um uh he was already you know he's like silly things that silly women spend money on but it's also sort of a bulwark against socialism and uh i was like wow the more things change the more they stay the same you know people still having the same complaints and misunderstandings and uh, how dismissive they are of it. Um, It's interesting because even very early on, as women start to wear makeup and they start to wear makeup in a big way, um, the voice of the beauty press, and I say this as someone who has been a, a beauty journalist, is very much the same. And it, in some ways, and it, a lot of it is about this is a skill you must conquer. Um, and I feel like that's another thing I've heard from women are like either read the book or, you know, hear me talk about it. And they're like, well, I don't really wear makeup. I never got good at it. And so I think the sort of overwhelming voice is if you wear it, you must wear it flawlessly. You must know how to apply it. Uh, and up until 1917, what changes in 1917 is we get the the first um, get the first patent on a lipstick case, like the one that we're sort of familiar with. It's a little different, but it's the general form that we're familiar with, and that makes lipstick suddenly something you can carry in a purse or a pocket. And women are just going out in public more, so they are leaving the house and taking it with them. Before that, lipstick was very much um it was it was a it was a toiletry item it was a boudoir item and you wouldn't brush your teeth at the dinner table so you wouldn't put on lipstick at the dinner table and a matter of fact uh, the writer um oh god her name just flew right out of my head and i can see all her books uh, uh she wrote the age of innocence edith wharton who is you know sort of the um you know, considered the expert on golden age, uh, Victorian America. Um, she didn't object to lipstick. She found reapplying lipstick in public to be a filthy habit. She thought it was absolutely foul because it was such a person to her. It was such a personal thing. It was like, you know, flossing your teeth at, or, you know, hiking up your underwear at the table. It just wasn't something that was done in polite society. So the objection at the beginning really isn't to women wearing makeup, but it's supposed to be this big secret. Like, you know, you just roll out of bed looking this way. You don't talk about it. You don't bring it into public. And it's like, you know, there's no way you had an 18 inch waist and, you know, these fluffy skirts and this giant hairdo, like, 
you did that, but you did that in the privacy of your bedroom. And so lipstick is like one of those items like, oh, no, no, I no effort at all. I just rolled out of bed looking like, the, you know, looking like Mae West. And it was the bringing it into public that was the big changeover. And um, sort of by the time it arrives as an item for public consumption in the 20s, people are okay with it. Uh, there's not mostly not a moral objection. I mean, there's always someone who, you know, you'll always find some preacher who's like, you whore. Uh, but it's instead sort of more of a, um, if you're going to wear it, you have to be up on the latest shades and what looks good on you and you have to apply it perfectly. And it's, you know, it's, there are a million skills that women are supposed to have uh, like child rearing and cooking and housekeeping. And it, it's just sort of added to the list of things like it's just some born in knowledge you have by virtue of being born female that you know how to handle all of these things. Uh, and if you don't, you know, kind of that's what the beauty press is there to help you with. And then the later sort of people like Max Factor, like expert, we get this whole expert class. Um, so I think people think the objection was in the beginning was moral, like it was uh, unseemly and associated with actresses. That's actually not true. There were a lot of upper class women who had makeup practices that included things like enameling, which was a, an early, it's exactly what it sounds like. They were painting their skin with enamel. Uh, uh, there were these early makeup practices, but it really would have had to have been women of a certain leisure class because um, enameling, for example, literally cracked if you moved your face too much. It was kind of proto-Botox because it kept you from moving your face and you couldn't be running around after kids. Someone else was nannying your kids and you weren't, you know, milking cows or or you know, hauling hay or anything of that sort. So, um, you know, way back in the mid, I think, you know, certainly pre-Civil War, mid 1800s, you hear about society bells using cosmetics to improve their looks. Um, and, but you really don't, there's no tisk tisk about it in terms of it being a sign that you're, um loose or or um too sexy it's more that like it's a well-kept secret and you should you know my, you should not tip your hand and let people know what you're doing and it's it's, it's really interesting like you said to see that some of those attitudes are, are still prevailing today um yeah. particularly you know in popular media where you know they've woken up and they just look like that um <laughs> those kind of things those yeah. kind of things are still prevailing. Um, but you mentioned a couple of really interesting things there that I really want to unpack. Um, sure. you know, talking after you know World War One and the painting and the the invention of the lipstick case. Yeah, you know, those are the two really important moments in in this history, and 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 that you mentioned in your book that they they start to democratize and revolutionize um, the cosmetics industry and opportunities for women really would you would you mind unpacking those those kind of ideas there it's very interesting because um you know take for an, uh, something like dating for example dating is a very modern concept uh you mainly you know people pre-industrial revolution like you didn't really date you were either in an arranged marriage or you met a neighbor or something you know like your neighbor had a son your age and you worked it out and you, people would come, you know, very Victorian people would come to the parlor and your family would be there. You were very supervised. But the idea of leaving your house with someone your own age or, uh, and going and having leisure time out in public is very modern. Um, and after the 20th century in America, you have more people in cities for the first time than in rural areas. And you have a whole immigrant class. 
and you have the invention of leisure time. You get Coney Island, you get um, the movies, the Nickelodeon, you know, the dance hall, places people can go and spend a little their little extra cash and spend their off hours because they work five, six days a week. And uh, so that is a newer thing. So, and just women having a place to go in London, Selfridges is famous because they had among the, they had some of the first ladies rooms. And uh, in New York, you can see we have bars, like there were bars that didn't admit women until the seventies. And you can see that like, uh, the bathrooms were not at all designed for women. They're like all urinals and they installed a couple, you know, like probably never had dividers. Uh, but so there, there are a couple of artifact bars like that in New York, but places like Selfridges and in New York on the department stores on Ladies Mile, it was literally just having a place to be in public, more women in the workforce, more women outside the home and more places that women could go on chaperones. So just being out in public and part of that is the um, invention and adoption of the car and you know, people are just more mobile than they've ever been in their lives uh, previous to previous to that in human history. So just going out in the world was, a, as women, was a newer thing. Um, lipstick remained, a, you know, there were similar things to the lipstick tube. Like it didn't just blow up in 1917. There were like similar items but it was messy and it was hard to transport. Um, often women's clothing didn't have pockets. It would, it would ruin the inside of a purse. But like the invention of that push-up lipstick, uh, that lipstick case where it was contained was really revolutionary. And women just being out in the world war and going to the movies. The movies were another thing like, the movies, you know, you get the, it changes mass media and fame. Suddenly you have famous women who are famous, not because they're the wives of presidents or politicians. Uh, they are actresses, they are, but they're more available to, you know, vast numbers of Americans rather than like being on Broadway or touring. Um and you get this class of experts like Max Fax Factor is the um, the most notable one. Uh, people also knew the Westmore family. Uh, but so you suddenly get all these things come together. The, the lipstick to uh, women having disposable income, women being out in public, um, the movies all of which come together, like, I, it was sort of amazing to me how much of um, the advent of lipstick, just every woman wearing lipstick was tied in with technology. And even if that technology is just, the, it's not AI, it's the, the tube, although it's now tied into AI. Um, so it was, those changes all came together around the same period. And so you get, uh, uh, you just massive and a, a sort of baby boom, a, a sort of mini youth culture boom, um, which normalizes lipstick and makes it an everyday item and makes it something that's part of your getting dressed and going out in the morning as much as putting on a hat and gloves. Uh, and it's part of being seen and being, it just becomes part of the package of this is what women wear to make themselves presentable. So. And it, it's really interesting that it's 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 emerged this kind of perfect storm really yeah uh where opportunities are are being made available and now available uh, all at the same period and it's a very a very fascinating time in american history and particularly for american women as well now i i want to i want to dive more into the term american women as well because it's not just white women in america at this point um you know how does the cosmetic lipstick industry uh, work or not work with African American women and uh, other women from different minority backgrounds. It's fascinating, and that's a whole other book that I hope someone gets to write because uh, I don't know that that's my story to tell. But 
you know, America's first self-made millionaires, female, full stop, was uh, not inherited wealth with a woman, a black woman named Madam C.J. Walker, who actually made her fortune in hair care. Um, and she's fascinating. Her money via her daughter um, helped har- bankroll the Harlem Renaissance. And, you know, her home is now a historic site. Uh, you know, Black women were just as interested in beauty. They faced the same pressures that white women did uh, to be pretty and find husbands and, uh, you know, it, uh, work outside the home for financial necessity. And then an, an entire layer, an entire layer of pressures on top of that, which is the the standard was and greatly still remains, although it is getting much better, uh, the standard of beauty was white. And the advice that you see in the black owned papers is very different. And it's about, you know, maybe not too much lipstick. You don't want to overemphasize your lips because that was not considered as attractive as, as, you know, features associated with white women. Um, but, you know, obviously they have, they're under the same pressures and the same, uh, um, expectations as, as white women. And then that whole layer on top of it. And there's some very interesting things that happen. The mainstream beauty industry largely does not, for most of its history, does not specifically cater to women of color. It doesn't adjust its color palettes. There are very few, you know, foundation shades. So they do develop. There are a number of companies that develop to serve this community uh, very specifically. And one I found really interesting was uh, Lucky Heart Cosmetics. And um, there were two of them that were similar. And the other one's name, I'm sorry, escapes me right now. and they were founded by Jewish families, or one was founded by two Jewish guys in Chicago. One was founded in Chicago. The other, I think, was in Atlanta or Nashville. And they had a model that was very similar to Avon. You shop from the catalog. They had door-to-door saleswomen. They also had salesmen, which is a little different than Avon. And that was a good workaround because a lot of the stores were segregated. And so not only was, you know, Revlon for the most part, for the most of its history, not thinking about you as a customer, you may not want to go into the Woolworths uh, because that could be a very uncomfortable experience. So they were, you know, to the trade to the community and it was a person to person, sort of like an Avon lady, but for women of color. So that was a very good selling model in some ways. was a way of working around the, those difficulties. Um, you know, it is an incredibly complicated and fraught history. Uh, Cosmopolitan didn't put a black model on the cover until 1973, and it was Beverly Johnson. Um, it was it, it was surprisingly slightly beat by uh, Good Housekeeping. Had its had was like the first major women's magazine. Had the first black model uh, on the cover, but you know they were largely not represented in ads unless the ads were in magazines like Jet and um, other magazines that specifically catered to black audiences. Uh, and same with uh, Latino women, Hispanic women, um, Asian women. They were largely not seen in the ads. If they were, they were exoticized. Uh, I remember opening up an ad that was in the 90s, for Christ's sake. And it was in one of the first issues of Latina Magazine. It was called Latina Magazine. And it was for Latina women. And they just had Cindy Crawford in kind of what you would think of as a like Latina outfit. Like they didn't even bother to go out and find a, you know, a Hispanic woman, a a Latina woman to put put 
lipstick on. Um, so it there are it's a very complicated history that reflects our own very fraught history um with just white supremacy and and it is getting better and i am a great admirer of the fenty brand uh and, and i'm not even a fan of rihanna's music i mean I, I don't dislike it i just it's not my jam uh <laughs> don't come after me uh uh because she just as a ceo she's just like you know what we're going to put women of color first and everyone else can fall in behind and that model has worked and a um a lot you know a lot of companies have come up that way in the last 10 15 years and it's great but it it has not been easy finding even today they have a very um companies fronted by women particularly women of color have uh, a very hard time getting financing and they're just not sitting in the on the boards and in product development. Uh, and some companies have a really crappy record of, of the way they treat women of color become an afterthought. And, you know, which is ridiculous because, you know, America is soon going to be a majority minority uh nation and they buy lipstick too and it's not just the right thing to do it's it, it's the right thing to do but it's also like leaving money on the table and there have been companies in the last few years that have gotten in trouble for it like um a Kylie Jenner's company they put out nudes and it was just like well okay but this is nude based on the assumption that everybody is white without their clothing and that's not what the world looks like. And the world market is just so huge. Um, and so vastly, vastly different. Uh, you know, what appeals on one continent or one country is not even the same. Uh, East and West are totally different uh, in, in terms of like, you know, what makes an appealing product. Um, it's so fascinating how that that industry has reflected um america uh, and american values across time as well um for for an area of history which people don't typically consider to be reflective yeah. it, it's incredibly reflective it's incredibly reflective and it's just incredibly american and i apologize yeah. for that because, you know we come stomping in with coca-cola and hershey bars and like red lipstick whether you want it or not and in some ways and so uh it's it's a very interesting it's another way we do this cultural ambassadorship you know and americans are very insistent on their own way and uh in some ways that served them in some ways that's failed us but uh it it is this very american insistence and like on it in like this is what beauty looks like i mean we had a during World War II, we had a um, one of the things we were sending British women was lipstick because uh, as in care packages, it's like they I, I they were out of underwear, you know, nice nylon underwear and lipstick. And we sent Queen Elizabeth and her sister care packages with American lipsticks in them because uh, that's, you know, British women were using they're very uh, resourceful. They were using um beet juice and shoe polish and just everything they could think of to substitute for lipstick because the war effort had sort of killed the cosmetics industry and that well, was our the, form of international goodwill yeah it's 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 brilliant that it's even thought of as that icon of of goodwill and something that you would send a princess uh at that point <laughs> now there's there's two uh there's a point there that you you're mentioning about you know, the, the the industry dying during these periods and there's and there's two periods which are incredibly close to one another where the lipstick cosmetic industry kind of takes a hit um or is affected by the economics of this of the the period or the situation and you have both the the great depression in the in the 20s and you have world war ii how how does 
the cosmetic lipstick injury uh, injury industry <laughs> reacts to the the Great Depression and and World War Two, and how do women's attitudes do that? You know, do they change during these periods? They adapt. Um, uh, and the uh, you got to say in the way the cosmetics industry is, you know, very clever and very nimble. Uh, and I was always kind of impressed with the way that they could shuffle around the, the advertising to meet the moment. And whatever sort of was on top of mind for people, they they were right there. Like, oh, yeah, we hear that, too. Um, so, for example, during the um, the Depression, you have the largest number of women entering the workforce. And this is not like, I need a career to be fulfilled. They're like, I need to not starve to death with my family. So you get women in the workforce in the largest numbers ever and they're taking clerical jobs and uh they're you know that sort of thing still very what you might call pink collar work uh and the women they turn to women's magazines for advice and the advice is like you know it's all very well and good to be a great typist and to like be smart and to be able to take stenography but are you pretty when you are going out there and it becomes such a thing like okay but do you you know like you're competing with a lot of other women and beauty is currency and beauty will set you apart and they're really not you know there's some of them they're just out and out like well it's nice that you have a high school diploma because this was an era when not everybody did and you know like it's swell that you can type and it's kind of funny and it that like they are very insistent with keeping up on lipstick and, you know, um, you know, not, there are a lot of, of jobs that women are working where it's not really possible, you know, being working in laundries and uh, food preparation and all these things where it, it's kind of a very unglamorous uh, existence. And they're still like, yes, but are you, you know, really what you want to be when you, uh, go into the workforce is pretty and feminist and that's also kind of a defense against like you don't want any guy thinking you're taking his job um and there's an element of to it of what i call con just consumer porn like uh some of my favorite movies or one of my favorite movies from the 30s is the women and with joan crawford and rosalind russell and uh and claudette not claudette colbert uh anyway it's it's just a wonderful film, and it's the costumes are done by the same designer who designed uh, Dorothy's dress for The Wizard of Oz, the fabulous Adrian, and he just was this consummate designer. And it takes place during the 30s, but there's sort of no hint of the depression outside. It's that's kept very quiet, and the film is in black and white, and there's a like a almost. 10 minute sequence where everything stops there's no plot there's no talking nothing's going on it's just a fashion show and it's in color and it's these sumptuous evening gowns and tennis wear and stuff to wear sailing and yachting and on vacation which who is going on vacation it's the depression and uh it's it's just this fantasy of of what your life could be like if you were rich and pretty and well married and uh i think the movies also really and the idea of makeup really starts to feed into this consumer porn idea of like uh you will catch a rich husband you will be socially prominent you will know what to wear for polo matches if you wear these lipsticks and then lipsticks are named in such a way that they they speak to like exotic travel there's taboo and tattoo and um all of these brands like sub dub lipsticks which means sub you're not quite a debutante yet you haven't made your debut in say in society so they speak speak to ambition and they speak to this fantasy of wealth that 
Americans are always just, um, you know, they feel that they're always just steps away from, and that for women, beauty is really, is going to help you strike it rich. So the industry very much adapts to that in the depression. During World War II, it's fascinating. That was one of the first chapters I wrote, actually. Um, it becomes part of the war effort and it becomes part of uh, distinguishing ourselves from the Axis powers. Um, fascists outlaw makeup. Hitler really hated lipstick. Uh, he associated it with Jews, first of all, and he associated it with, you know, just, it was unnatural. It was Aryan women were supposed to be clean scrubbed and naturally rosy and, 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 and beautiful. Um, and all of the fascist powers try and outlaw makeup to varying extents. And, um, you know, um, America loves itself, not just as a, you know, as a, as a global military power, but like, we're very in love with our economic, you know, like how much economic choice we have and what a, a superpower we are as an economy. And cause we were, it adapted to wartime shortage, but we were still churning out lipsticks and the lipsticks become, uh, part of um one you you're not some some stinky old nazi because you can wear as much makeup as you want and be glamorous uh two with the boys away it is important not to share not to to slack on beauty to think like you know it's all sweatpants and uh you know and and ponytails from here on in you got you still got to get yourself up and it becomes this part of patriot this patriotic act even though you're now working in a factory, which women, women had always worked in factories, but not in this capacity. They're like working on the assembly line rather than things like um, sewing. Uh, so it is this, it becomes this point of pride with us that we have like, we have Jeep red lipsticks, our, we have uh, auxiliary cores with like every branch of the military. Uh, and they all have lipstick. You can buy lipstick at the canteen. Um, and we are not slacking and we are going to, you know, outgun them and outman them and, uh, you know, look better than them, look better than the Nazis doing it. So this is, we were fighting fascism and the, just the copy as a copywriter, like I'm lucky if I get two sentences in, in an ad and the, there are just these entire stories within the ads, like you, you're winning the war with buying war bonds and wearing lipstick and staying pretty. Like you're, you're keeping the home fires burning. And it's sort of, it's this amazing form of propaganda. And, you know, people are turning in metal cases uh, for recycling so we can build make bullets and bombs and tanks uh and and so on and so on and it's but it's just kind of this amazing part of the war effort that you're continuing to wear lipstick and look good is somehow helping the boys over in the trenches you know fighting the battle of the bulge it's so, it's almost this this triumph of marketing really yeah. of just adaptation to to suit any situation really um it's 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 incredibly fascinating how that was able to be spun to become a duty um as much as a, a desire and a need um oh, yeah. for professional it's, life yeah it's it's kind of insane <laughs> when you yeah. look on it but you know like if someone no one told you like you know the two like you could fight the war on terror if you just more <laughs> But it 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 made sense at the time, and it was the industry keeping itself alive, and it it it's almost this wishful thinking, you know, like I don't know how much good like turning in nylons was doing, but it made people feel a part of the whole. So it is a very useful exercise in that sense. Yeah. And there's, uh, there's a fascinating turn after the war as well. That there's a turn that you use in your book, which I, I thought was absolutely amazing um and you and you mentioned that it's it's putting women back on the pedestal 
what uh you know what what was this this placing women back on the pedestal um yeah, what was it you know what was happening you see and it was you know that's a really interesting adjustment for women because suddenly like they were making a paycheck and they're like oh it can work you know and they're um you know they had spent the last 15 20 years in and you know some women working because of the depression and then some women joining you know joining that force on top of that because of world war ii and so women were largely outside the home and they were handling things and they were you know i had a professor who used to say women don't have it all they just do it all and you know we were doing it all and then all of a sudden the boys come home and it's time to step back into the kitchen and i think that was a tough adjustment for a lot of women but again the industry uh adapts to that too and i think there's a sort of um it becomes part of the cold war because the culture converts to this uh the you know this post uh world war ii this nuclear world and this um uh, you know, the, 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 the expansion of the Soviet bloc by just saying, you know, like we can fight this too <laughs> if you just stay feminine, if you just stay feminine enough. And one of the interesting I, things I found in women's magazines of the era is a couple people did go to Russia to, uh, on tourism visits, either as chess champions or as exchange students. And the first question they ask them is, do they have lipstick there? And not like, well, that's an amazing that you're a chess champion or what did you learn? Um, but they do, they, they don't really, the Soviets take the opposite tack, which is like, it's American decadence. You don't need it. Um, so it, it just, it moves from, actual world war ii to the cold war and is redeployed as like this way of of you know being a family and being a mommy and being feminine and a or a teenage girl um you are fighting communism you are fighting uh the red menace is actually the title comes from one of our uh the way we talk about communism that it's this creeping if you if you just turn your back, it'll creep up under the bed and it'll be there. It'll be in your house like like um, termites. Uh, and it's just everywhere. It's around every corner. It's hiding in every closet. It's, you know, you know, check the toilet twice because there are communists everywhere. And um, again, lipstick becomes this like triumph of consumerism, this triumph of capitalism over communism and it could always be worse. You could always be in Russia where they have, they don't even have lipstick. They just have some weird kind of like Vaseline with mink fat in it. And uh, uh, it it is so, it, it, yeah, it's a little bizarre. And I'm sure I'll say that in 20 years about whatever we're talking about now, but uh, it just, be, it's such a part of the culture that it becomes this insane, you know, Berlin Wall against uh, the you know Americans wanting socialized health care or something <laughs> by you know like you don't need that you have matching nail polish and lipstick you live in the best world. It's, <laughs> it's 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 fascinating as well how it's gone from you know you're doing this to defeat the Nazis and to win the World War and then you're doing this to defeat the Russians and defeat communism and to win the Cold War um, and it's you know, such a such a journey, but still a very similar message there, which is which is fascinating. But you know, during the during the Cold War, you have you know periods of liberalization, increased consumerism and, and capitalism, as you mentioned, and the rise of you know popular culture. You know, what what happens to lipstick and how do how does it adapt uh to you know these rise of you know more more liberal attitudes and pop and pop culture. It's interesting too because I obviously we didn't invent the teenager in the 1950s. They've kind of always been around, but like you know the idea of the young person uh, really um, Madison Avenue as just sort of a stand-in for all advertising. 
really discovers that young people like this baby boom generation, this post-war young person's generation has disposable income. And so it becomes, you know, you, we sort of come to prey on their fears. Like, do you have pimples? Are you unpopular? Is your breath bad? Do you stink? Like all of these things. And it it becomes part and parcel of selling them Elvis albums and, you know, rock and roll and like the ride, this huge rise of youth culture, which we then export to the rest of the world. Um, and so, you know, America gets very good at this period of exporting um, youth culture and exporting, you know, like Elvis was a huge commodity, just rock and roll. Um, and, and I love, uh, I'm a huge rock and really fan, so I actually kind of love what other countries do with that. You know, you see in the Teddy Boy culture and in the UK and Japanese have their own interpretation and all over the world. Uh, but we start to export stuff like rock and roll and lipstick comes along with that as part of youth culture. Um, moving into the 60s, it's we get the British invasion. It starts to move the other way. We start to get imported brands as you know, Mary Quant and Yardley, and those become the hot brands because for once we are importing uh, for the first time in in many in a couple hundred years, we're like starting to import culture rather than export it. Um, but you know, it is a huge part of American consumerism. Is something we have you know again, like we will come stomping in with Coca-Cola and McDonald's wherever you are. And it's a big thing about creating, you know, we exist to create new markets. Like, um, so there were jokes about people going to the moon with silk stockings and Hershey bars. Uh, so it's a big thing. And it's interesting, like, the industry then has to adapt again as the 60s come on and the youth culture starts to reject being advertised to. They start to reject um, lipstick and 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 just general, um, you know, you get the hippie culture and, you know, they're like, we don't want to be advertised to, man. They do just in another way. And so um, the industry really struggles to adapt to this new, um, freer, more, uh, you know, more self-determined and, and generation. And it's interesting because I think there's an interesting flip again in the seventies in what I always describe as the, the industry learning to speak feminism. And it starts largely in 1973 with, uh, L'Oreal's because I'm worth it campaign or because we're worth it because you're worth it. It, that will change over the years. But it's this idea like, oh, what if we took the 60s messaging of rejecting um, rejecting the norm of makeup and we make it empowering? We make it, you know, we make your makeup, your lipstick be a feminist statement of who you are. So lipstick gets to be entirely more personal. You, It's less about just chasing the trends and more about telling the world who you are. It's more lifestyle-y. It's more... Um, you know, I decide how sexy I am. I decide how I present myself to the world. Uh, and again, women in the workforce now as, because they want to be, because they, you know, they are putting off marriage and they are putting off children uh, and the sexual revolution. And it becomes part and parcel of that. It also uh, becomes part of, I, the seventies chapter was actually, I never, th you know, like I never think of it as a high style, uh, period for Americans and for American fashion. But then I went back and I looked at it and I actually found it, it was one of the most fascinating chapters to me because it contains Stonewall. So just breaking the gender norm, um, starts to become a thing because one of the fights that Stonewall was over was the cops could arrest you if you were wearing something of the opposite sex and uh we're god we are still fighting that today uh in florida and a bunch of other states where we are for some reason cracking down on um drag queen and trans people for no reason 
Uh, but, you know, a lot of this, the Stonewall uprising and the gay liberation that comes with it is about cracking, it's about breaking those gender norms for some people. And, uh, or the choice to not wear lipstick, the choice to not opt into like all of the trappings that we have told women that they need. Uh, and also it becomes punk rock. It becomes subversive and like that it becomes part of rock and roll. And, um, you know, you see glam rock and Bowie and the New York dolls and, um, you know, later in the eighties, you'll see Adam Ant and, um, uh, boy george and all the hair metal bands but it to me the 70s was actually a lot more interesting than i thought it was going to be makeup beauty wise because it was just it became about either some the industry subverting in itself in a saleable way by taking you know making it not making lipstick speak to feminism and it became very subversive with both Stonewall and just rock and roll in general um, uh, about, you know, starting to see like the origins of punk and, and um, new wave and heavy metal uh, or hair metal, not really heavy metal. Uh, <laughs> don't come after me uh, in, in all of that. And so it's, it's the industry will flip according to what is going on in the zeitgeist, whatever the political culture is, the industry will find a way to get along. Because it's... it's speak- it, I mean, that really seems like the prevailing theme uh, throughout your book and, and through uh, the lipstick industry and cosmetic industry is that they're able to really quite cleverly latch onto you know, social movements, political movements, and cultural movements to to really capitalize off that moment. Uh, and it's it's fascinating. Yeah, and it's not entire. I mean, it sounds entirely mercenary. It's not. I mean, they are people <laughs> <laughs> they are people who are living this in this world too. And you're seeing uh, certainly in the current era more female entrepreneurs, more non-binary, more gender non-conforming. So there are people, you know, who want to see, you know, companies want to see themselves reflected in this world. Some people do not. I mean, there's always, you know, Charles Revson who ran Revlon was kind of like an unashamed jerk. Like he really was such a jerk. Uh, uh, Didn't get the whole women's lib thing. Um, But you know, so some of it is sincere, you know, it is a, you know, companies are made up of people, people who live in the same world you do. Uh, some of it is very mercenary, like what our marketing says, uh, you know, diversity is big now, so we should get in, in on that. Um, but it is uh, there the, the industry's ability to adapt and the, uh, what we tell women we they want is very interesting and um it, yeah the industry has always been very clever about speaking to you know it ranges from like you want to catch a husband you want to look young to to much more subtle messages and much more interesting messages and 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 the industry i think now is it's always changing. It's always adapting. The way people consume information is different. The way every generation consumes advertising is different. Like I'm very Gen X, you know, I thought I was punk rock and like, (laughs) you, you, we very much felt like we we're too smart for this. You know, we don't want your, your labels. Uh, Yes and no, but, um, uh, or we just went out and found different brands that sort of spoke to us um, or tried. Uh, but it's, it's a very, it's a, it's a very adaptive industry almost more so than anything else. I mean, the car industry moves more, has to move slower. The movie industry is very slow. Makeup is very adaptive uh, for what's going on they can change pretty quick and i i 
you know you see that you've seen that throughout your book really and i think it's fascinating read that you can you can track those changes as you go along reading through chapter by chapter uh and one of the the final pieces of adaptation you you speak about in your book is is the rise of the internet uh and how the internet revolutionizes the industry you know you know would you would you mind you know talking to us about that and 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 the role of the internet in the industry today yeah i think one of the good things and the bad things about the internet is that everybody's an expert <laughs> you know, everybody is an expert on everything and that's especially true in beauty and you know in the 90s for example there were all these brands that were built around makeup artists and they were the expert and there was like NARS and Lorac and um, Kevin O'Quan and, you know, um, all of them based around the idea like these guys are, you know, PhD in, in, in lipstick and they know everything about it. So that was the following. And it was easy to entrust them with your money. Um, now there are a lot of influencers and some of them are makeup artists and some of them are just people sitting at home in front of their mirrors who've just gotten really good at doing their makeup. Um, and there's nothing not legitimate about that, but they have taken um, a certain amount of power away from either uh, the company telling you like this season, we're all about berries. That's the look. Uh, or uh just the idea like this is the guy this is max factor is going to tell you what to wear this season um so there's a certain democratization in that and there's a certain like um and then companies have to scramble around to meet uh what you know you know they go to where the influencers are uh which has had mixed results and then there's um a very weird amount of trust that to me because again gen x that we put in celebrity like um uh you know again like kylie jenner ended up with her own jillion dollar line of lip kits and i'm not inter entirely sure what her background of expertise was other than being like a famous pretty person. Um, so people are really a little, also a little willing just to divorce from um, that need for like a pedigree of expertise. And there is just a fast fashion element to it. Like people are willing to turn over very quickly. Like, um, you know, this season, the red is, you know, you can say like, oh, it's a little darker or it's more orange or, um, and, you know, it's sheer, it's matte, whatever it is, people just change over much more quickly. And I think you also see that in things like Sephora, like it, it's just, it's, they've taken away that layer of, um, woman, usually it was a woman at the counter. And uh, which is in chopping away another layer of expertise. Um, a, a another weird side effect is just like uh, magazines, like in the US, Allure was a huge magazine for the longest time. And they were, you know, sort of one of the papers of record. Um, print is folding up just because people consume information differently. So I think people are, they still want that one magic bullet, like go to influencers, that's guaranteed sales. It's not. And especially if an influencer goes south or crazy or does it, the line doesn't work out. Um, go to celebrities, uh, you know, everybody and their dog has a line of lipsticks now. So I maybe, um, so it's just so the internet has just made stuff so diffuse and so segmented. There are, um, you know, and wonderfully so, there are entire lines that are just sort of appeal to the non-binary. And uh, their entire lines, you know, they're like, their main messaging is cruelty-free. Uh, we use the word clean a lot. It does or does not mean anything. Um, 
so people are, it's the industry is so segmented uh, and the internet has allowed people to just uh, find something, you know, find that really teeny tiny sliver that's theirs uh, or that's theirs for today. You know, like I need clean uh, animal cruelty free glitter. And, you know, you know, you're a couple of, you're just a couple of Google searches away from that. Then I need all the reviews on it. So just the way people consume is, is much different. And the industry, it, this is just trying to find a way to keep up with that is, you know, it's, it's toppled like Revlon declared bankruptcy this year and they were a major player since the depression. So, um, it's a very complicated world now, beauty wise, and there is no one overarching message. So it's really about, you know, everyone trying to find their diverse, clean, vegan, uh, uh, you know, old or young niche in there. And, you know, maybe you're going for everybody over 40 and maybe you're going for everybody over 60 or maybe you're going for you know, tweens, it is so hard to be all things to all people anymore in a way that it wasn't when uh, it was just, you know, pretty much just the mass market of L'Oreal and Maybelline and uh, CoverGirl. And then in, and then there was like the high end of Chanel, like the world is yours now. Uh, at every price point so it it's the internet has made things very complicated uh yeah i mean with- i mean i mean certainly from from where i've observed things you know i've seen whole influencer lines emerge you know gain massive yeah. popularity and then you know a year later they're just gone um and it's an incredibly fascinating industry um to to watch from afar without being involved in it too much yeah, and people are like <clears throat> they're very attracted to like personalities and I you know they're weird everybody and their dog has licensing now. Um so there's just like muppet makeup, you know, like somebody had a Miss Piggy line. So I I I grew up on the muppets. I love them. So I went over and I looked like I looked at it and I was like I don't necessarily want to look like Miss Piggy, you know. It just why would I pick that as a beauty thing or like baby yoda and you know baby yoda is great i love him but i you know would i as an adult professional lady pick that as some as my look i don't know but you know it's kind of awesome somebody did somebody i'm sure somebody's looking great in it um so it's just it's you know you get these weird licensing deals um I, somebody sent me a press release not in the last couple of years for a cup of noodle the like ramen cup of noodles pour in boiling water and i'm like i don't even think of those as a particularly like i the what's even colored in there it's like just beige and uh but no they got a whole a whole themed makeup line so some of them make sense or some of them are just not for me uh but yeah and also like I think the other explosion that we've had is is just the explosion of drag and drag race being mainstreamed. And it's, um, uh, you know, that is a thing like um, contouring used to not be a thing for women because it was just, you know, it was a, a, you know, it was also very, it was either very subtle and, you know, it was designed by drag queens to feminize the face. And then all of a sudden you see people and they are, you know, actual female women like contoured within an inch of their lives. And it's like, but your face is already shaped like that. You don't need to create the illusion of your face being shaped like that. I It's, it's very strange, um, but it's, it's a whole lot of factors. And yeah, the internet has just kicked open every door created a lot of weird makeup celebrities you know some i like there's one bailey saranen that i was watching oh, during the a lot during the um one when i was writing this book and two is just the pandemic and it she would put on her makeup and her makeup always looked really neat uh she and 
and she would tell you the story of some serial killer. So it combined like true crime plus some really cool eyeshadow looks. And I thought that was very clever because those were two things people were really into it in, in the moment. Um, she's a big influencer and that's, she found her niche. I mean, it's all about finding that, isn't it? It's all yeah, about finding that and attacking that. Yeah. So it's, it's just, yeah. What else is out there? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> now I wanted to ask you a final fun question. Uh, as we do for all our guests here on the History of Jackson podcast. Now, some, something I found particularly interesting in each of your chapters was that you mentioned a shade of the decade. Um, oh. Now, I, I don't think it's going to be Martha Washington's, but I'm, I would like to ask you, what was your favourite shade uh, that you came across whilst researching? Oh, God. Uh, there's one that's just called Ashes of Roses, and I, I think that appeals to my inner goth child uh it's poor i think it's poor um but oh god going but also going back to the 90s i remember some of those from like high school college where i was just like oh that was a terrible shade but it was so big because i change all the time but i have one i bought one recently that i was like i'm gonna say that's my favorite color um and it's from nars and it's dracula it's talk about licensing i love universal monsters and it's <laughs> bella lugosi it's it's called Dracula and I love it. So it's not from Nars. All great that. names. <laughs> yeah. So it's oh, it's not from Nars. Uh now they're not gonna send me free lipstick. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's from Smashbox. I'm sorry. Smashbox Dracula is my current favorite. I, I I think when I was going through, I was thinking they're just all fantastic names. And I think whoever's naming them. You know, they I, deserve. <laughs> I've got to name some eyeshadows. I've always wanted to name lipsticks. It's actually, as a copywriter, one of my favorite uh, assignments is doing namings, uh, just because <laughs> you kind of want to get it in the area of the color. But I think people have given up on that. And people are like, it's called Whisperer or it's called Montauk or it's, you know, like it just doesn't have anything, <laughs> no clue what the color is, but it sounds like dreamy and and aspirational and like vacationy or something like that and uh so i i if anybody out there needs color naming get in touch because i will do it because it's such a <laughs> there's some there's some great names out there like revlon cherries in the snow was like a like a classic red for years i mean I, i've i've always been fascinated whenever i've walked through the aisles just looking at the names uh, it's always, it's always. I've always found it very interesting. Yeah. Now, no. if if our it's listeners want, he was doing that. Yeah. <laughs> now, if our listeners are going to want to go away, and of course they are after yeah. this amazing conversation, they're going to want to go away and learn more about the history of lip, lipstick and cosmetics. Where can they go, and what can they read and listen to? Uh, my website is lipstickbook.com, so you can start there. Um, Gabriela Hernandez, uh, who actually owns Besame Cosmetics, uh, wrote a great book uh, on the history of cosmetics. Um, you know, it's interesting because I, there were things around it that I find great. Uh, there, If you want to learn more on Western stuff, uh, a, a friend of mine just wrote a book, which I think is interesting and sort of parallels some of my own research on the way we think about the West versus the American wild West versus the way it actually was. Uh, and it's her book, I think it's just called Western wear. She's uh, Sonia Abrego, A-B-R-E-G-O, Dr. Sonia Abrego. And um, similarly, my friend wrote that book on leopard print, which is called fierce, the history of leopard print by Joe Weldon, J O W E L D O N. Um, and they're not exactly makeup books, but they're interesting because they deal in some of the same construction around how we advertise to women and fashion history and how we have, you know, fashion and beauty mythology, and then we have its actual history, and those are not the same thing. Um, um, but we kind of like them both. Uh so so those were those are are some of my 
my recommendations uh, in the field, but if not necessarily on top of the same thing. And also um, there's a great book on beauty history called Hope in a Jar uh, by uh, uh, Kathy Pice, P-E-I-S-S. And uh, that's on the history of like the beauty industry in America. That was a great book. They 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 all sound like brilliant reads to, to increase knowledge around the subject. Yeah. And, and today, today we've heard just a facet, just a very small sliver of the amazing stories and histories that you have, you know, spoken about and written about within your book, The Red Menace. So where can our listeners grab a copy of your book? Uh it, it, it is for sale in the UK. Uh and I know somebody bought it in Australia. Uh, we'll start at lipstickbook.com and I will find the link for international. It's on Amazon. I try not to throw to them. Uh, but uh, you can, and you can always ask your bookseller for it and they will get it for you. Well, I'll make sure a uh, a link for your website and a link to buy your book is in the description below for our listeners. So hopefully they can yeah. go and grab themselves a copy. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And I've had a really great conversation with you. Thank you so much. 